the disaster that has defined modern geopolitics and it's been a challenge to writers, musicians and artists ever since. Tansy Davis's new opera, Between Worlds, tackles 9-11 by focusing on five people trapped in a room on the North Tower of the Twin Towers after the first plane has hit. It's a piece that's already divided critical opinion and I went to see it last night with two FT colleagues, Peter Aspden and Laura Battle. Peter, tell us first of all, how does this opera tackle the events in a dramatic form? Well, it very wisely, in my opinion, uh, doesn't confront the, the vastness, the momentousness of the event and focuses instead, as you say, on this rather small cast of characters to try and get a sense of intimacy among, uh, amid this extraordinary drama. The characters are fairly stock characters. There's a man who has a little bit of a tiff with his wife, a woman who has a tiff with her child, a woman who leaves the rapturous embrace of her lover to go to work in the morning, and then a young man who's, it's his first day in the World Trade Center, and he's afraid of heights. Knitting it all together is the janitor. This happens on the kind of middle level in terms of set design, in the middle level. Uh, below is the chorus, the background characters, and then on top, another very interesting figure described in the program as a shaman, but but very godlike. It's a neat and rather elegant construction, I think, but of course it is competing with an event which is one of the most visually familiar events. We all have those images burned inside our heads uh, and it's, it's a big ask and I'm not sure it successfully does it. Laura, tell us how um, Tansy Davis's music, what kind of experience it is listening to it. So the opera is structured um, by 11 scenes, um, each of which is said to be based on um, a series of 11 chords. The sort of symbolism has, I think, always come into discussions about 9-11. Um, and uh, musically, somebody like Benjamin Britten used that same sort of conceit for Turn of the Screw, where he had a, a theme that kind of rotated through the scenes of the opera. Um, in that, I think it sort of cranked up the tension. Uh, for this piece, I wasn't particularly aware of the... Um, strength of the structure listening to, to it. Uh, what I felt was more successful was the, the kind of um, impressionistic effect of the music and you got a real sense of the building through the sounds that uh, the orchestra is making, these kind of stomach turning glissandos and uh, the kind of grinding and, and growling of the steel. The way that she'd got the, the, the kind of vocal side of things arranged was uh, I'm sure a sort of referencing Bach's passions and those sort of oratorios. Um, I mean, it was, I think, intended to be a very spiritual piece, whether it succeeded in that or not. There was also, I found lots of echoes of, of um, classical Greek drama with effectively a chorus to comment on the action. Yes, I mean, that, that, that was the sort of lowest level. And, uh, and I like those parts, but my problem with the backstories is that they weren't terribly interesting backstories. As I said, we had these couple of tiffs. Um, we don't really find out very much about the characters and I think in that sense the piece doesn't quite succeed on either being epic or intimate. Lots of panicky phone calls to loved ones but not really making us care very much about them as characters and I think that was a problem. I think the drama was kind of dictated by this idea that they'd have very early on to use, uh, or at least kind of be inspired by the messages that were sent that WikiLeaks released a few years ago, sort of millions of different, of different messages. And so it had this effect of feeling very fragmented. They weren't really relating to each other particularly. They were sort of always trying to make a connection through the internet or through, through phones. So it, that, that sort of left it very fragmented. Yeah, and this was a huge problem for the libretto because those messages, I mean, if you read those messages, the transcript of those messages is incredibly moving. It's heartrending, but what's being said in them is inevitably rather banal. It's "I love you," "I miss you," "I may not see you again." You know, things which really touch the heart when you read them as a sequence of messages. Given an operatic treatment, 
I'm not sure they gain very much force or profundity at all. I've got to go back in coma. Tell her I'll call her later if I have time. Do you think that a contemporary opera or any contemporary art form, but we're talking about opera, so let's stick to that first of all, can deal with events like this and make us feel them all over again? Um, well, I think 9-11 was a kind of, is, is a sort of unique problem. I think opera has dealt successfully with contemporary events in the past, but this was something that played out in real time for all of us on TV screens. Nothing in, in literature or opera or cinema even can quite match that drama. So I think the most successful responses to 9-11 have been those that take a more oblique uh, look at the, the, the events of that day. But we are living in an age now where there is so much found footage around and as you say documentarians are becoming so skilled at playing with that uh, that it's getting increasingly difficult for any art form and particularly such a stylized art form as opera to compete with the vigor and the visceral quality of those images. And that wasn't the case even 20, 30 years ago um, when John Adams made the death of Klinghoffer. That happened at an event in 1985. We didn't have those images. The other problem that opera has, for me anyway, and it's not my favorite art form, um, but it's, it's that, um, can it really cope with the present day vernacular? You know, I would hear lines like, the stairs are blocked. What do you mean blocked? Oh no, the phone's gone to voicemail. Which, to me, listening to those lines operatically, they don't enhance them, to say the least. But there was a sort of playfulness with that, wasn't there? I mean, you had uh, the, a kind of sense of the static um, on, on the phone lines through the music. And also you had people kind of vocalising the sounds of, of mobile phones being engaged or kind of memory being full. So it, it was quite playful in the way that it... But a it, little it bit uses. trivial, I think. A little bit trivial, a little bit distracting. There might be a, there might be a really big problem here that because it is such an incredible event in our lives, in our century, in our whole geopolitical landscape, it's as if you've got to have, you know, everything you've ever felt about life, death and the whole damn thing has got to all be there. Other art forms maybe can do this better or have done well, this better? Well, you know, if you take Paul, Greece, Paul Greengrass's United 93, uh, very, very intimate, very claustrophobic, very effective at thinking about what it must have felt like to be in that plane. And that, that was an extraordinarily good piece of artistic work about 9-11. So was Man on Wire, the documentary about um, Philip Petit, uh, the man who made this extraordinarily audacious um, tightrope walk between the Twin Towers in the 1970s. I think the trick of, of any art form approaching this is to use the audience to, to trigger what we already, all of us, have in our minds, a kind of knot of different thoughts about, about that day. Um, and t to leave it like that as sort of an absence in the film like you have with Man on Wire, that it's kind of ever present in your mind. We have to say the Barbican audience yes, in that yes. large mm. hall mm. was stunned into silence, silence and there absolutely. were several whole minutes of complete silence before the applause even began. There was a kind of sense of how can we respond to this and, and there was a woman in the row in front of us crying. Mm. Um, I think there's a real appetite um, today for sort of operatic works that, that try to do something spiritual. I mean, the work of um, Peter Sellers, for example, Deborah Warner has adapted the St. John Passion and Handel's Messiah for the stage for ENO in the past. And it seems to be sort of part of a trend. <laughs> When I went back last night after seeing it, I, I, I just felt compelled to watch, and this is something everyone can do on YouTube, you can watch NBC's live coverage of the Twin Towers collapse, and it's more harrowing than anything opera and maybe any art can do. That question that still crops up in conversation, you know, where, where were you when yeah. you heard the news, is part of us all trying to write ourselves into that day, sure. to, to, to find some sort of meaning in it. So I think a lot of the responses are completely trivial. I remember reading Alan Bennett's uh, diary entry for that day, and it was a really short paragraph, and he just says, I watched the second, the first tower 
collapse on television and then I went through to the kitchen and put the kettle on and it's just kind of, that's all there is really to say. Uh, you, can't, you can't go any further than that.